Science is real from the Big Bang to DNA. I see vinegar and I see baking soda. I bet you already know what happens when the two are mixed. The vinegar contains an acid and the baking soda is a base. When they're put together, they react in an acid-base reaction. The major indicator is the evolution of a gas, which is still fun for me to watch. This video is going to discuss the fundamentals of acid-base reactions. Our focus is going to be on reactions between strong acids and strong bases, and the neutralization reactions between them. So, no volcano science projects today. We'll save that for when we discuss acid-base equilibrium. What is a strong acid? What is a strong base? No, why can't we do any more volcano? To start, we need to be clear on what actually defines something as being an acid or a base. There are different ways of defining acids and bases. We will discuss two ways of defining them here. The first is the Arrhenius definition. This is the original definition of acids and bases created by Svante Arrhenius. In this definition, an acid is anything that produces an H plus in solution, and a base is anything that produces an OH negative in solution. Consider the following solutions. The first two would be considered acids because the H plus would dissociate from the anion portion, and the next one would be considered a base because its OH negative would dissociate from the cation portion. The last one would not be considered an acid or a base because it produces no H plus and no OH negative. Well, that is all well and good, but in fact, if I dissolve sodium carbonate in solution, the pH is higher than seven, meaning it makes basic solutions. So, sorry Arrhenius, your definition is a little too limiting. So then we welcome Bronsted and Lowry. The Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid or base is a little broader than Arrhenius's. A Bronsted-Lowry acid is one that is a proton donor. What? Protons? Think about it for a moment. Strip away the electron from the H atom and you are left with a proton. Well, that is great. Arrhenius, Bronsted, and Lowry all agree that the H plus makes something an acid. However, Bronsted-Lowry base is, covers more than just hydroxides in that this type of base is defined as a proton acceptor. So anything willing to bond with that H plus acidic proton is classified as a Bronsted-Lowry base. Let's look at our list again. The two acids are still acids. They're both willing to donate that H plus to something that wants it. The hydroxide compound is still a base because OH negatives love H pluses. What about that carbonate? I think of that big old two negative attached to that carbonate and think, would that thing like some H pluses? Yes, yes it would. Therefore, according to Bronsted-Lowry, that carbonate is considered a base. Now that we have a clear definition of what defines something as an acid or a base, and yes, you do need to be able to differentiate between the two definitions, we can actually answer Andy's other questions. What is a strong acid and what is a strong base? Well, it all comes down to dissociation. Strong acids dissociate completely in solution and weak acids only dissociate a little bit. Hmm. This sounds a lot like another strong and weak reference we've discussed. Electrolytes! Remember that strong electrolytes are solutions composed of completely dissociated ions, while only a small fraction of dissociated ions exist in a weak electrolyte solution. Of course, you aren't going to have a light bulb set up every time you encounter an acid. And there are many acids you will encounter when studying chemistry. So how do you know which of these are strong and which are weak? Well, you have to memorize them. More memorizing! Yes, but fortunately for you, there are only six. 
hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, and hydroiodic acid are all strong. Notice all three of these acids are made with halides. Well, then you've got that fluoride again. Hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid. That fluoride just loves to cling to what it grabs. Also we include nitric acid, perchloric acid, and the first proton on sulfuric acid. That second hydrogen is just a little more clingy. Well, there you go. Six acids to memorize. If you know you have an acid and it is not one of those six, then you classify it as a weak acid. Reactions with weak acids actually get a little complex due to the equilibriums they like to establish. For now, be able to identify the weak acids and just don't dissociate them when you're writing them in their equations. What about bases? Well, that is even simpler. A strong base is one that contains a hydroxide. A hydroxide is able to completely deprotonate any acid as long as there's enough to work with. Any other base is considered a weak base. Before we continue, I want to take a moment to clarify a point that students often mix up. That is the idea of strong and weak versus concentrated and dilute. Here you see I have a container of one of the strong acids, hydrochloric acid. Notice I'm using it in the fume hood. That's because hydrochloric acid gives off chlorine gas, which is toxic and can irritate the throat and nasal passages. The container I'm using is concentrated HCl, 12 molar. 12 moles of HCl per liter solution is the most I can get into solution. That is as concentrated as I can make it. Most of our labs will require a more dilute solution, which we will make using the concentrated solution. I'm going to show you how to use this to make a 0.5 molar solution. The idea behind a dilution is that the number of moles in the concentrated portion is equal to the number of moles in the new dilute version of the solution. Here I have a solution with a certain molarity. To dilute the solution, I will take a portion of the concentrated solution and move it to a new container. Once I move it to the new container and fill up the remaining portion with distilled water, the solution will diffuse throughout the container and homogenize. Though the moles of solute transferred are the same, the new solution overall is more dilute. Look at the same volume of each container. The one on the right has fewer particles in solution per unit volume. To get moles, we need to multiply molarity by the volume. Since we want the moles to be the same, we can use this equation, M1V1 equals M2V2 to figure out the desired volume of concentrated acid we need to make our dilute solution. I'm going to make a 500 milliliter solution of 0 0.050 molar HCl from a concentrated solution of 12 molar HCl in this volumetric flask. The question is, what volume of concentrated HCl do I need to transfer from the 12 molar HCl to my volumetric flask? We can figure it out using M1V1 equals M2V2. I set up my initial conditions as concentrated and the second half as dilute. Now I know that concentrated hydrochloric acid has a molarity of 12 molar. If I write 12 molar as the initial condition, I'm trying to figure out what volume of that I need to make 500 milliliters of 0 0.50 molar solution of my diluted hydrochloric acid. I divide by 12 molar on both sides. My molarities cancel and I'm left with milliliters. And that's great because we're looking for a volume. We just do the calculations. And then do some sig figs. I 
I now know that in order to make a 500 milliliter solution of 0.5 molar HCl from concentrated HCl, I need 21 milliliters of that concentrated HCl. I've measured out 21 milliliters of my concentrated acid in a graduated cylinder, not a beaker. I can also use a volumetric pipette or a graduated pipette. You'll get to play with those later. Making an acid solution requires safety precautions. You always want to add acid to water. Why? The acid is going to react with the water and produce heat, which could cause spattering or even boiling. With the bank of water already in there, the heat has someplace to go so that it doesn't spatter acid all over the person making the solution. You see, I've already added about 200 milliliters of distilled water to my volumetric flask. So now I'll just add my acid, 21 milliliters, and give it a swirl. I'm going to add some more distilled water. You see I stopped just before the line on the volumetric flask. Now comes the patient's part. I'm going to need to put in the rest of the water drop by drop using a pipette until the meniscus just reaches that line. The volumetric flask is designed to fill up to exactly 500 milliliters of solution when the meniscus just touches that line. So it's imperative that your meniscus does not go too far over the line or you have a different molarity. And there we have it. We now have a 0.5 molar solution of hydrochloric acid. I just need to make sure it's properly labeled with the correct concentration and date, switch it around, let it have some time to homogenize, and it's ready to go. So what did I do? I created a more dilute solution of hydrochloric acid from a concentrated solution. So did this change the strength of the acid? Nope. I used hydrochloric acid, which is completely dissociated, whether it's in here or in here. And that is what defines something as being a strong or a weak acid. However, there are fewer moles of this acid dissociated than this one compared to this one. I can do the same with acetic acid. Glacial acetic acid is as concentrated as we can get when we talk about acetic acid. Vinegar is a more dilute solution of acetic acid in water. Is acetic acid going to be strong in this bottle? Is it one of the six? Nope. Whether concentrated or dilute, only a fraction of acetic acid dissociates, so it's still considered weak. Science is real.